Okay, so we continue. So today we want to just have a recap. We were looking at message passing interface. So with message passing interface, first of all, we just want to now look at what is a message passing. So in operating system concepts, you looked at different ways of inter-process communication. So you're looking at message passing and you are also looking at shared memory. Okay, before we continue, if there is something, you can just interrupt me by talking because now I am not able to switch between the chats. I'm not able to still see the chats only. Figure out as we go on how to able to see the chats at the same time as I present. So if there is anything, you can just inform me via the chats. A meeting of people will also be... Something else. So are you able to see my screen? No. Okay. What about now? Just use the audio. Yes, we can see. You can see it? Yes. Oh, good. No, no, okay. it's disappeared. It's disappeared again. It is? It has disappeared. It has disappeared? Can... Yeah. And now about now? Yes, now we can. Okay, then we'll use it like this. Looks like if I do the slideshow, it disappears. So let's just use it this way. So good, so we can continue. So we have message passing. So it was just a way of communicating. One, you can communicate between different threads within a process. You can also communicate between processes running on the same node. We can communicate by passing messages. Also processes which are running on different nodes. Nodes, we can look at it uh, such that nodes, one of the examples can be different pieces. So when they're running on different nodes, they can also communicate using message passing. So you find that when you're talking about messages being passed between different processes, then we're speaking about inter-process communication. So with message passing, it has widely been applied in parallel computing. So with parallel computing, usually, if you look at it, when you're running your program, one of the things is that usually you run your program on your particular machine. So when you're running your product program on your particular machine, it's usually more of um, running one process at a time. So with the computations also, you're running it step by step. Then with parallel computing, what do you want to achieve? You want to improve computation you want to improve computation speeds so by improving the computation speeds we want to be able to get for example if i have a particular function so i have one function if that particular function is computing a number of things i want such that with this particular computation i can divide this computation into parts which will now be processes so each part is given to a process so the process computes the different parts and returns to me the results. So I want it such that it's now parallel. Instead of having it serial, that is step by step, such that with this particular computation, it has to compute one, then compute the next, then compute the next. So if I have maybe four things to compute, I want all these four things to be able to be computed at the same time. And then to be able to now do that, that's where the parallel computing comes in. To be able to achieve parallel computing, that one of the things that we now use is the message passing, where we now have 
different processes. So the idea is to fully utilize our particular machines. So your machines, usually when you buy, you'll have Core i3, Core i7, etc. So those ones are just now the more of the processors. So the processes are now more. So if the processors are now more, then you fully want to utilize all the cores in your machine. So to be able to utilize the cores in your machine, then you also want to write programs that can fully utilize the cores in your machine. So to be able to do that, then that's where the parallel computing is being introduced. Then of course, apart from parallel computing, then you'll find that people are now using things like now the quantum computation is now also coming in. People are researching on that. So the idea is just to make computation faster. So you might just want to be able to compute things faster because the idea most of the time is you'll be calculating something. So you want our calculations to be faster. So you see it's more of you want to perform a calculation or you want to perform computation efficiently. So usually that will not be possible on a single computer. So if you're just looking at your computer just like that, then it will not be really simple. So you want such that you are able to use now the particular processes. So parallelization will not be able to be handled by just the compiler. You'll have to write your own code to achieve parallelism. So that's why with parallelism, they have various techniques to achieve parallel computing. And one of the techniques that they use is now message passing. So with message passing, you're explicitly passing the data from one computer to another as it's being computed in parallel. So if you're looking at message passing, remember shared memory, they are all sharing the same memory. So if you're looking at now message passing, you are assuming that we are having each computer having its own memory. So each of the processes, you are assuming that they are all having their own memory space. They are not sharing their memory. So if they are not sharing their memory, then one process does not know about another process. So if we process one is computing something, process two will not be able to know what process one computed. And the only way for process two to be able to know what process one did is by message passing. So they have to communicate by explicitly passing the messages or passing data. So the data is passed in the form of a message. So one of the things that has been introduced to be able to perform message passing is the message passing interface. In the first class we said with message passing, there are various ways or various applications of the message passing. So message passing interface is just one of it. We said also, if you look at things like socket programming, there's also message passing being implemented. So for us, we are specifically looking at MPI, the message passing interface that implements message passing. So with this particular message passing interface, it's more of a language independent communication interface. So it's not for a particular language. It's not for Python or C Sharp or C++, no. It's not for a particular language. It is just a communication interface. So it is a de facto standard for parallel computing on distributed memory systems. So with now this MPI or the message passing interface, then different vendors have now implemented this particular communication interface. So you find that now Python has its own implementation of MPI. If you look at C++, it also has its own implementation of the message passing interface. So there is now this MPI, which is now independent. It is now standard, it's standalone, 
Then now, from this particular communication interface, then other vendors have now come in and, and tried to implement this particular communication interface. So, with this one, the message passing interface is just a collection of functions. So, it's more of also, you can also talk about it as a being just a library. So, programs, different programs can be used or can be written to implement the message passing interface. So, most MPI programs, you'll find that they are based on single program, multiple data. So, you're going to look at that. Mainly, you're now looking at just one particular program, then we are creating clones of that particular program. For example, if I have a simple function which you're going to look at, like squaring, so if you have a simple function to just maybe square numbers, then you have a range of numbers, maybe up to 10 numbers that you want to square. Normally, if you have just written that function and you run it, it's going to, first of all, for example, if I have number 1 to 10 and I need to square each of those numbers, it's going to square number 1, then square number 2, then square number 3, then square number 4. Now that is serial. Serial is such that it will go one by one. So if I have squared number 1, I get the answer. I'll go to number 2, I get the results. I go to number 3, I get the results. It is C. Now that is more of serial. But now we want to look at it in terms of how can I create my program so how can i write code such that it's now it's now running in parallel now if i am now giving it for example to square 10 numbers it's not going to wait such that it has squared number one then square number two then square number three no it's going to square all the 10 numbers at the same time for example then how do i achieve now that where it's parallel all the 10 numbers are being squared at the same time then that's where we are now creating that processes so i'll have this particular single program which is more of now my function to square numbers then for each process it's going to run more of a clone of the program so each process is going to run a clone of the program because for each process are given each different numbers to square then once they have they get the results of all these different numbers i can Decide such that if you now get the result, then send me back the message or send back a message to a common process where I will now get the results. So when you're looking at a process, I've been talking about a process, it will just be an instance of a program. So the instance that we've talked about, an example where I have a square function, then with the square function, I'll be running clones of that particular function. So each process will be running a clone of a function. And then with the clones of the function, then you can call them instance of a square function. So when you're running this particular MPI, you'll find that you will be able to state the number of processes that you want at the beginning of the program execution. So if I say maybe I'm running and then I say I need this to run with four processes, then it will just run four processes and not be able to add an extra process while it is executing. Unlike when you're using threads. So threads, when it's running as a thread, it can be able to actually add more threads as it's running but with processes if you're looking at this you just say maybe you're running and you say i need this to run as five processes then your particular execution will be will be actually broken down as five processes so then uh -huh. so for each of this particular process the processes are usually assigned a number or a rank. So there will be the process, then we assign them numbers. So number one is so process one, process two, process three, etc. So the number of processes is not necessarily the number of processors that you have on your particular machine. So a processor may execute more than one 
process. So the key thing is that we just want, first of all, the idea is to fully utilize the processors on our machine. But then we're also saying that if, for example, I've written, I need this to run with four, uh, I need it to run four processes, so four instances of, for example, my square function, and then I only have maybe one, core I1, or really have one processor, on my particular machine, then it does not mean that it will now not be able to create the four instances. It will still create the four instances, but the, the, they will not run as fast as, for example, if I had four processors, and then I want to, uh, to actually create four instances. So we'll find that that's what you've been talking about with this particular statement. If you want to ideally have parallel speed up, then each process must have exclusive use of one of the processors cause. So if you want to have an ideal parallel speed up, it can one if you just have one of it, it can still achieve, that is, it can still run in parallel, but if you want to have now the ideal parallelism, then maybe you now have to, if maybe you have seven cores, then you can just have seven processes running at a go. If you just want to have the full ideal speed up. So running MPI programs with one processor core is really fine for testing and debugging, but of course, it will not give you your parallel speed up. So we have, to, we have also been talking about message passing. So with the message passing, let me check. Um, hello? Hey, hello. Uh, okay, I've been informed that some people are uh, in the waiting room uh, who are waiting to be admitted. Yes, I have just seen that right now. There were 16 of them. I have just admitted them. Yes, I am also trying to get used to this platform, so apologies for that. No, it's not popping messages. The way Zoom does not popping so that I can see. So that's why I might actually be on this side, then I'm not seeing the messages coming in or the people need to be admitted. But I'll figure it out as I go on. Thank you. So when we are now going back to this, when you're now looking at uh, exchanging of data now between the processes, if you're now using the processes, the message passing, you'll find that the processes do not share memory. So each has a distinct memory space. So if you're looking at each having a distinct memory space, if, for example, process one was has a result of part of the calculation, process two has a result of part of the calculation, process three also has a part of a result, then what does it mean? If I need the total result, then I need to tell process 1, 2, and 3 to send me their results so that I add and get the total results. So that is, that, uh, that's what it means. So they need to be able to send message, and that's why now you have a send and receive. So you find that with communication, you usually have explicit function calls. They're not implied. They're explicit. So that's why... You're looking at now the send function and the receive function. So you have the send function, we also have the receive function. So with the send function, so you're sending something to other processes with the receive function, the process is receiving something. So it's receiving maybe the data calls, so there's a receive function. Sending, it's also sending some data. So both the send and the receive must be executed for the communication to be able to be successful. So in my example, I use Python because you have informed me that you are at least 
conversant with Python programming. So I decided to start with Python. It's also easy to start with. I have seen you different assignments. You have used different uh, things. Some have used Python. Some have used C++, which is all okay. This is just a programming language. The key thing is that you just need to understand what is happening. Then you can apply it in whichever programming language you prefer. So Python, I have just used it because it's, first of all, simple to understand. If somebody is starting to understand a simple concept, then you can use any other programming language. So don't worry about the programming language. For those who are wondering why, I am on Python. So if you're using now MPI with Python, then um, I can summarize it into four things. One, you just have to import the MPI module. So it's usually in Python, is MPI for PY module. Then also you have to initialize MPI. Remember, you've said MPI, first of all, it's a loan. So the message passing interface is now just a library with a set of functions. It is a loan. Then all these other vendors have just tried to now implement this. MPI. So they've just tried to apply MPI. Then depending on the programming language, they're now applying it in different ways. But now the key functions in MPI will always be the same in any programming language. So you just, if you're using a Python, so Python, one of the things that you usually do is just import modules. So you can import your MPI for PY module. Then you can now initialize now the MPI. So that once you initialize it, we can at least also be able to now access the methods that are in the MPI. Then you now do your computations. You can now do your communication between the processes. Once you've finished, you shut it down by writing an MPI finalize. So when you're writing it, uh, you're creating a communicator object, which I saw most people have already done it. So you're creating a communicator object. This is just a variable name. So you have the MPI com world. So you have your communicator object. So com is just the object that I have created. Then from com, at least now I can be able to access the methods inside MPI. So from com, so with that object, I'll be able to now access the methods. So with whatever name I give to the object, that particular name is what I now use to access methods within the MPI. So I now use it to carry out communication between the processes. There is also the send because you said you have to send and receive message. So there is a send method. So with the send method, you just have to now know the arguments that it takes. So we have the send method. We have the object containing the data. So if it's a variable that is containing the data, etc. So you just put it there. So there's now the object which has the data, which can be an array, it can be a float, integer, whichever data type. Then you have a destination because you're sending it. Where are you sending it to? So you have a destination. Usually you write the rank. We've seen a process has a rank. It can be process one, two, three. So you're saying maybe I'm sending this data to process zero. So I'll write the destination as a rank. Then I can just have a tag, which is just a number that can be used to distinguish among SCDs. So I can also have a tag. So we will find that if uh, sometimes we'll find that TV data can also be, uh, be able to be held in just a buffer. So usually buffers for MPI communications. Let me check something. So that's a call send. Also receive is just the same thing. The only thing that you now have to see is where uh huh. I think it's the source. I mentioned the wrong thing. So you have for the source, not destination, but the source. Where is it? Where do you want to receive your data from? Then, of course, you have the 
tags for these ones and this so you have to send then you have to receive then you've talked about the rank where we return the rank of a process in the communicator we can also get size that is the number of processes because now you want to now get the total number of processes that we have you can get the size because maybe you want to loop through the processes so you want to now know how many are they so you want to know how many they are so that you can be able to loop through the processes so this does the get size function then if you're running it with python also to be able to execute it i can one of the things i can use is mpi execute this is also mpi run so i do api execute i say the number of processes that i want so if i want four so if i want four instances so i write four so this is just python then the script.py is just the name of my particular file then i run it good so that is on the recap let me stop sharing this so i wanted to now do um Let me share something else. So before I continue, okay, let me first of all share this one, then we will look at that. Right now I'm sharing now my desktop so it should be easier. So this is now an example for something that I really wrote. So with this one, before we now before even the MPI is this uh, for you to understand the simple concept of what you're talking about the processors then we look at now how we can apply it in mpi so if we are now looking at this so this is a simple the uh, a simple function called square so with a simple uh, function you just have an argument which is just a number then you square the number then you print the number square result is that so the result is this one so i get the number i square it i print out the result so this is just my main function so in the main function in python so i have my array so i have my numbers so one two three and four i want to square each of them so to be able to square each of them i need to call my square function so i'll just loop through the numbers as i call the square function i pass the number as argument and i print out this so this is just a simple function i run it then it says the number so because one so the number one squares to the result the number two squares to the result number three squares to the result so this is just a simple normal function that we usually write so with this particular function you're now doing things serially so serial in terms of it will square the first one then square the second one then square the third one then square the fourth one then outputs and then now we want to now look at what if you wanted to do it in parallel then what we do and that's where we are coming in with now trying to create the or trying to now add the what do we call them the processes so you want to add the processes 
So to be able to do that, then uh, before we even come to MPIs, so with the message passing, so before we even come to the message passing, this is just the general concept. So usually in um, in your Python, you can have the usually the OS. Then from OS, you can import process. So with process, this is where you now are able to create your processes. And uh, you can also import current process. Current process will just enable you to do the current process. So I have my simple function square. Now I want I'll figure out why it's fun. So I just want to be able to create a particular process, but I'd already written this down. Let's just continue with one which was already working. Let's use process ID instead of name of process. So we have this, it's the same thing, it's just my particular square function. Then with the square function, I just want to add processes to it. So simply, oh, I did not import, okay. So simply, we just have to import the process and the current process. Then once we import them, process is just for you to be able to create the processes, current process, just to see the current process. Then we that. I want to be able to, in my loop, I want to now be able to create the processes. So I will so in my loop because I don't want them to actually be done serially. So I want to just be able to first of all create the processes. And you see, to be able to create the processes, I have a process. So this is to be able to create the process. And I want to be able to create the process. One of the things that I'll have as argument is the target. So which function do I want to create a process from? Because I said with the processes, it's an instance of a particular program. So I want to create an instance of my square function. Because the name of my function is square. Then, also the next thing is the arguments. Which arguments does my square function take in? So if you look at the arguments, my square function takes in the argument number. So that's the process. So I don't need now to call this function here because I already see that I am creating instances of square function. So I have it that. Then... Uh, this one I can I'll hold it in a variable called process. So I have that. Then to be able to start this particular process, I have a function. So there is process dot start. So there is a start function. So with the start, you are able to start your processes. So with that, I have created the process, I have created the instances of the process. Processes, we say they have names, we also say that they have IDs. So here I am just creating the number this squares to that. If I wanted more information such that it can also print maybe the ID of a process so that I know that this one is on process one, this one is on process this, 
or the name of the process that this one is coming from process this and this one is coming from process this i can also be able to output i can print it out so let's see if this one executes or it has errors current process Okay, so excuse you have an error where you have the arguments number. Just oh, excuse really? you have a semicolon and you haven't put anything there. Mm -hmm. But this one should run, let's see. Mm -hmm. Still has an error. Any other error that you can see that I'm not seeing? Because uh, try putting uh, number args equals number in parentheses, like number in parentheses. Okay. Like that. Yeah. There is this one. There is the integer object that is not iterable. It cannot iterate through a particular integer, the int data type object. Why is it not on 13? Somewhere in 13. Um, could you try and print the number? The number in the form? Yeah, like, yeah, let me see if, if it's actually a number. You can comment on 14 and 15. 14 and 15. Number. Okay, let's see why the first one worked. So let's see by the same thing. Let's see why it worked or oh, it's not working. The sun is working. So maybe you try it out on your side, we see, because this one is working, because we have our, hmm. so we are looping through, there is now the phone number is the number, so we have our processes that we have created, we have a target, which is the name of a function, then we have an argument, so one of the arguments is the number, so you just say process start, so you do process start, it should run. Whatever is outputting here is just what we have, the number, which is this number, the, the result. 
this extra thing is just the process ID, which there is a function get PID, which you can get the process ID. Then you just print the process ID. So I am having each of them in a process. So we have the ID that, so the, like the first one has a number, the, uh -huh. There is ID 7808, then there is for number one. Then the ID that number two, it is C. So let's try this one out first. Why is this one not working? Uh, uh, excuse me, there are, there are more people in the lobby. Oh, there are more people in the lobby, okay. Let's try it with that. Then we run it the MPI, the message passing uh, interface one.
So I hope it's working on your end. So if you just need to say something, just use the microphone because now with this one I have to switch windows. So it's easier if you just you just use the microphone. from process ID printing out the process name it's just the function current process so like a process ID is just the function get PID if you're looking at process name if you wanted to print out the process name so I have my variable process name so if I wanted to print out the process name then I just use the current process function process dot name prints out the name so then you can now use it maybe if you're printing so like here I'm just saying process ID then I print process ID if you're having a name then you can just say the name then you print out the process name so that is running first uh, your program using parallel computing hope it's working on your side on your end
Oh, just now we can continue to the MPI. Let me see if it's okay. Lovely. So we the MPI one. I had uh, I had given you this this code in the particular document that I shared. So this is now this was just to just uh, for you to just see how communication can happen. So we have said we the communication with the message passing we are passing messages. So we are sending it send using send and receive. So we are sending the messages and receiving messages. So this was a very, very simple thing to just send a message to a process and receive a message from a process. So here we are now using the message passing interface to be able to now communicate with the processes. Remember here, I was just showing you that we can have, we can create processes. That's it. So here I'm just showing you that we can create processes, that we can do parallel programming instead of just running everything in one in serially, we can also do, we can compute them parallel using parallel, uh, parallel computation, we can do a parallel computation, we can do something in parallel. So here with the MPI, we are just simply now saying that we have now the message passing interface, so the message passing interface we are now able to now use message passing to be able to pass message from one process to another. We need now these processes to communicate. Here we were just creating processes. Now if we need now these processes to communicate, then we can now pass messages so that they can communicate. Then how do we do that? Then there is now this message passing interface that has already been defined the only thing that we are doing on our end is just using the methods that have already been defined. So with that, we now want to be able to communicate between the processes. So we say the first thing you have to initialize it. So you initialize, so there is MPI, so we create an object, com. Then with this object, com, we can be able to access the methods in MPI. So the object, you can call it anything, but you want to give it a name that you can relate to. It defines more of what it's doing. So this is more of communication. So it's the name of the object is com. We say each process has a rank. So I can get the rank of a process. We say that we have a number of processes because we say we now with the processes, we can maybe say we want four of them or five of them. Those are just instances of a particular program. So here it was just sending a message, just so that I can send a message from one process to another. So here there was the message which was hello from, then you have the rank of your particular your particular process. So with the send, because we say to be able to send and receive, we have a send function and then we have a receive function. So with the send function, you send the message. So what are you sending? You send the message. Where are you sending it? To the destination zero. So to process zero. So you want to send all messages to the first process, which is process zero. So if your rank is not equals to zero, then send a message to process zero. Else, so if your rank is now zero, then you have to receive the messages. Because they are sending, then there is a process that is receiving all the messages. So with receiving the messages, then you are, there is the receive, then where I where is the message coming from? It's coming from a source, a particular source. So you're looking at the procedure that is the process ID. So we are looking through from one to actually this is supposed to be the number of processes anyway. Process. 
So then uh, the number of, uh, so you're looking at the maximum number. So when you're executing, you will, you will specify, you will explicitly specify how many instances you want. So then from one to the number of instances that you have specified, then the message will actually now be, be sent. So if you're not, if you're zero, then receive the messages that are being sent from all other processes to be able to receive there is now the receive uh, the receive function then the just the process the process which you're getting it from so the, because the, the processes are many so you have to look through each one of them and that's why you have the procedure ID we are looping through each of the processes and then we are receiving a message from that so this output is just process zero receives message from then the ID change, if it's one, then it will be one, two, then two. And then the message is here, hello from, then you write your, the rank, which is your particular, if you process one, two, three, it is C. So that is what was happening here. We were just sending messages to process zero, and then process zero was just receiving messages from all other processes. So, if we just run this first of all, let's see. So, with this one, to be able to run it, I was just using an Anaconda prompt. So, just using the CMD. Because now I have... Uh, I have active. I have actually created an environment called TensorFlow, so I was just activating my environment. So I just activated uh, my environment, which was TensorFlow. Then, uh, from now, my environment, which I have now activated, that's when I was now writing my this. See, to be able to execute, so then you can write your MPI exec. Then you can now write the number of processors or instances that you want. Then you write the name of your file. So that's how I executed it. So you can write the same thing now. So there is now the MPI executes. Then can do four. Let me do five. is test npi.py then when you do that then you will see your results then this now because we said you want to print process zero receives message from then the id of the process so the id is one so i'm seeing process zero receives message from process one then this hello from so the message itself, because I said also print out the message. So the message itself is hello from, then also concatenate, that is add now the rank. So if it's one, then process one. So hello from one. Then process zero receives from two, and also hello from two. So that's what you see here. So just the processes, so sending and receiving the message. So this is what you were supposed to just output. So one part of the assignment was just for you to just be able to output this. So you have to just copy it the way it was, then see if you can output it. So this was for you to just test if you you can be able to send and receive messages.
from one process to another. Are we able to do this? Are we able to do this? Did it work on your end? Did it work on your end? Ah, good. Alan had it working. Ah, good. Naomi. Ah, good. A number of people had it working, so that's a good thing. So I hope Newton has been assisted. So now that this one worked, there's the next thing. So this is now what we were just supposed to do, everything that we have done. Then we are just supposed to now apply it in now the a trapezium. So the trapezium thing was just for you to just apply it there. So when you're looking at now the if you're looking at calculating area under the under uh, area under the curve, then with the area under the curve usually we can now calculate it by having dividing it into a number of sections which are now the trapezoids. Then with the trapezoids, we calculate area for each of the trapezoids. And once we do that, then we will have an approximate area under the curve. So we will not have the exact area, but we will have an approximate area under the curve. So Let me stop sharing and look for something to just just in case somebody was lost somewhere so that we can uh, can assist in just a recap of how that trapezoid looks like so that we we are on the same page on what you're talking about. So I just wrote something. So I wrote it by hand, so I hope my, my handwriting should be clear enough. But if there is uh, something that you cannot read, you just inform me. 
So there is no, with the trapezoid usually, there is now the simple area. So the area, you have, you have your height, then the bases, base 1 plus base 2, then divide by 2. Time the height, you get your particular area of a trapezoid. But now we were looking at now trapezoids line, uh, line sideways. Because now we want to get the area under the curve. So we are normal trapezoid, we now want to look at it line sideways, where now the height is at the bottom. Remember, yeah, so height is now at the bottom. So if you're looking at it that way, then if I have a simple uh, trapezoid, like now this one, then if I am looking at a height being at the bottom, then it means that my bases are on the sides. So I want my bases to be on the sides. So I want, still want to be able to calculate, calculate the area as B1 plus B2 over 2 times the height. So now that my bases are on the sides, to be able to now get the side, which is now the y, I'll calculate it using the function to be based on the x. So for example, the functions, you have very uh, the different functions for a particular area. So you have, if you have your particular curve, so this, the line has a particular function. So e.g., if you had a function f of x such that the y is x plus 2, then I will get my x, which is 2, then my y should be 4. So if I had also a function such that I'm saying f of x is equal to x, then it means that you also check the y. f of x equals to uh, maybe x plus 1, then the y is x plus 1, etc. So you just get your particular x, pass it through the function, you have your y. And with your y, now in our case, our y will be now our b1. See, this is a b2, then our y will be on the b2. This one was not applying this function, so don't be confused. So this one would not, did not apply this function. But here, if I wanted b2, now it's 4. If I wanted b1, it's now 2. So that's divided by 2 times the height, I get the area of this trapezoid. But then, if you're looking at area under the curve, you want to get areas of maybe two, three, four trapezoids. So there will be more trapezoids over here. So you want to get the area of the trapezoids. So to be able to do that, then to be able to get the area of the whole under the curve, you will want to get area of trapezoid one, area of trapezoid two, area of trapezoid three, and area of trapezoid four. So the idea was then with this, we can now use parallel computing. So instead of doing this serially, such that I am getting area of trapezoid 1 first, then I'm getting area of trapezoid 2, then I'm getting area of trapezoid 3, I can use parallel computing whereby I can get different processes to calculate the areas of each of the trapezoids. Then they send their results to one process, process 0, then I can output the total results. So that was the idea. So with this particular assignment, first of all, we just had to understand that you can break it down into processes. Next, you had to understand that processes could communicate. Then the third thing you had, because now we are applying now trapezoid, first of all, before we get to this application, you had to understand what a trapezoid is and how to get the area of a trapezoid. Then how do we get area under the curve? Then also, the perspective such that our bases are now not the normal bases. If you're drawing a normal trapezoid, a normal tri move a triangle, now the bases are now becoming the y's, which you can get when you're running it also through the function, or you can just look at the values on the graph. So that was the idea. So this is just when you're having a curve. Don't worry, I don't have a curve here, but when you're having a curve, so you'll have trapezoid one, 
trapezoid two, three, four. So to be able to get all this area over here, I'll have to get the area of each of these trapezoids. And we have said that we are now looking at it such that the height is now here from X. So the height is here. The bases are here. So if you're looking at it that way, don't too fast to stop me. So if you're looking at it that way, so you'll have your height, then these ones will be your bases. If you're looking at something that has equal spaces from one number to the other, maybe this is x is 0, 1, 2, 3, then your height is just the same, so it will be. You'll have different, uh, the same range, that is the same uh, spaces. To be able to now So to be able to now get this, so I had my, so this is just an example of a function, ignore it. So I had my lower limit. So if A was a lower limit, B was the upper limit. So A lower limit, B is the upper limit. So that is now the range that I gave you. So I say maybe it's coming from zero to five. So this one will be the point zero, B will be the point five. So I have my A and B, lower limit and upper limit. These five are just the number of sections. The number of sections are just, if I have trapezoid one, two, three, four, these are four sections. So I'm dividing my under the curve into four sections. Then also I have to get the height. To go to get the height is just from, because we want to get this space, that is the height. So it is just from B, minus a divided by the number of sections, I know each particular section has what height. So I know the height. So that's the height. I just have to get my lower limit, that is the a, upper limit, that is the b, and my height, and also know my sections. Then I can now be able to calculate my area under the trapezoid. Well, that is area under the curve. So first things first, before calculating area under the whole curve, you needed to be able to at least write a particular function that can calculate area and uh, in area of one trapezoid so that you can now apply it to multiple trapezoid because now if i can create a function that can apply that is can calculate area of one particular trapezoid then it means i can create processes that is the instances of this particular function and they can create area of each of these trapezoids and send me the total results and i'll have my area under the curve i hope it's clear this is just a recap. So if you're doing that, then this is how my function worked. So I have my trapezoid. I just call it trapezoidal. That is just the name of my function. I have my h. You see my your h, you have your b, upper limit, a is lower limit, n is the number of sections. So, with that, I can get my height. So, then also I need my f, which is my function. So, with my function, I have just, you can create shortcut functions using the lambda. I hope you've done that. So, with the lambda, I'm just saying, so I'm just creating a simple function that is my f. So, input x, I'll put x. So, this is just f of x is equal to x. That was just a simple thing. Then my F is here. Then I also pass my A and my B, so 0 and 10. Then the number of sections is 5. So my results, because um, if you have written the long thing, the long expression, because it's divided by 2, so you have actually summarized your long function. So you'll have 0 0.5, which is the half, times the f of a, 
the f of a, the f is here, the function of a, a is my lower limit, so, and b is my upper limit. So you have the function of the two of them, so lower limit plus upper limit, get the total result, then with the result plus plus what you get in between. So I want the first one and the last one plus in between. That is the other trapezoids. So that's how it worked, running it. I got a 50. I don't know if I have lost you somewhere. Let me stop sharing. Who got, uh, who had another one? I think a number of people had it working. Maybe somebody can share. Okay, Isaac got a 14. Yes, so let's see what Isaac needs. Because Isaac got the correct answer, which is a 49. So mine has some errors, because mine has a 50. So it means that there is something somewhere. Let me see how to make you share here. Uh -huh. So give me a moment, I don't call your name. Can you hear me? to make you a presenter. Make a presenter, okay. Let me see that. Okay, now try again. I have made you a presenter. Okay, let me try. Is it working? 
Yeah, yeah. I think it's connecting. It's telling me. Okay. It's okay. Okay, so um um what 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 um what, what I did first was first calculated on pen and paper. Uh-huh. Actually now figure out where exactly am I going to like okay, how am I going to approach the problem? So okay. um, um we, we had a range which was uh, my X min and my X max. Mm-hmm. Then five was the number of um what is this? Um uh okay, yes, yes. five was our end. The sections. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes. The sub trapezoids, yes. yes. So um to get my now and then the y y is what you realize what I realize is x um x is just zero one zero one two three yeah so we okay. never okay the x the x um the, the the list of x would never use it anywhere so that's why I only use the list of y okay. and what I did was um to find the change in x uh, what um, I was doing was I was taking the x min and the x max. Uh-huh. X max minus x min, and then I divide it by the number of the sub trapezoid. Okay. Then um, I was looping through it. So um, what I was doing was the first and the last item, the four uh-huh. and the five, are not supposed to be multiplied by two. They're just supposed to be added as they are. Yes. So, yeah. So what I did was I checked if my I, I looked through them using indexes and I checked for the first and the last index. Uh-huh. Then. For 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 those that are not the first and the last index, I mm-hmm. multiplied by two by the item itself. Mm-hmm. Then for those that um are, are the first and last, I just took the, the item as it is. Mm-hmm. Then for the result, I just um yeah. So it's for the result, the result in every iteration. So I multiply the result in each and every iteration, mm-hmm. and this result. So once I run it, let me just mm-hmm. it. my answer comes to 39. Mm, that was good. Uh, I think it's because you already you have already defined your Y, so it's not calculating your Y, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's why it's very really accurate. Yeah. So, exactly. Yeah. Then, uh, then your uh, your MPI, did it run? Were you now able to? Put it as uh, processes. Yes, yes, I was able. Ah, okay. Maybe you can explain to us. Yeah, just yes, yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, what I did was use the code that we had for getting the processes, and um, yeah. So, um, all, all I did was. To take the mm-hmm. same code I had. You see, you can you, you can even get the code here. Yes. And then, then um, mm-hmm. figured that um, what I'm going to do is now split. Um, now that you're splitting it into I think three parts, what I was doing is I was splitting it into. Now I, I made I made three separate sets of Y's. So four, six, and then six, four, and then four, five. Okay. Then. Um, mm-hmm. I was now using the function I had now since it, it's going to steal and it's like getting um, the area of sub you see like it I've split the trapezoids into four and five four to five and then um, and like consecutively like that so mm-hmm. I define I define the same um, the same um, function I had and then mm-hmm. now Check if the rank is zero because the um, if the rank is not equal to zero, we send mm-hmm. we send the message to the process zero. Okay. So I I did that for every instance of y, so the y one, y two, and y three. Mm-hmm. And then from that, um, I was able to now um at the end of the day print hello from this and then the the rank that it is. Yeah. Then from my else, I was able to check um. The process ideas, if it's now mm-hmm. looked to the process ideas, and now to be able to receive whatever was was sent from process one to the other processes, mm-hmm. now depending on the number of um, process pr- processors that want when running this, yeah. Then after that, to return uh, to print the message, mm-hmm. yeah. So okay. um, let me try and run this.
um, MPA. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I haven't. Yeah, so. Uh, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, oh. oh, this is uh, the other thing. Oh. Yeah. It has, it's not executing the other one. It is. You, you have the one for uh, the one, that one is working. The, the serial execution. Sorry. I remember oh. when we were supposed to use four processors. So with four, you see what uh -huh. it does. It, it now does from the first Y and then okay. gets to two, um, gets uh -huh. from the second, and gets from uh -huh. the third, and then it sums them all, gets to 49. Ah, okay. Yeah, so it's because we were using four processors and I was trying to run it at six, so it was like. Meditation. See, it worked really well. So, let's see. Who else was able to do that? Because you can see that we have different code for the same thing and it's still working. Kevin? Oh. Did yours work? Uh, yes, it did. Do you mind sharing your screen? Oh, okay, just a moment. Okay, let me let me make you a presenter. It's the difference between Cop and Supreme and Taco Supreme. Now the risk here is you being topless online might ruin your chances of being topless on Netflix. As an extra Okay, now you can try sharing. Yes, it's loading on my end. Maybe you can just wait for some time. And yes, now I can see it on my end. 
Okay, so uh, what I basically did is uh, I declared my x and y values for the curve. Uh -huh. Then I just to plot the curve. Okay. Then after the curve, I used the area virtual mm -hmm. the angular, which is this. The height divided by two. Then mm -hmm. y is the first height here, and okay. y is the last height here. From there, it's two times all the remaining heights. Mm -hmm. So from the curve, I got all these values. That is the height, which is two everywhere, and uh, the first height, which is four, mm -hmm. and uh, the last height, which is five. From there, it's two times the remaining heights. I got my area under the curve as 45. Mm -hmm. From there, I had uh, some uh, other MPI execs, for both of them I used four processes, okay. but uh, instead of uh, dividing this into trapezoids and finding the area of each trapezoid in a separate process, uh -huh. I divided the formula into three parts, this part, okay. uh -huh. this part, and this part. So if I can just uh, show you uh -huh. uh, the curve using MPI, uh -huh. as you can see, this one, was calculating mm -hmm. 2 over 2 okay. and setting to process 0. Mm -hmm. Process uh, 2 was calculating 4 plus 5 and sending the result to process 0. Mm -hmm. Process calculating the last part and sending the result to process uh, 0. Mm -hmm. I was getting the result from 1 and printing the value. The result mm -hmm. from printing the value, the result from 3. From there, the area is the result from 1 times the result from 2 plus the result from 3. That gives mm -hmm. me the uh, curve, and that okay. is what I said in uh, the value from process one is one nine and four, and the area is forty nine square units. Oh, that's very good. Okay, that's good. Thank you very much, Kevin. You're welcome. So, is there anyone else who tried it using another programming language and could show us how? There's work using another programming language apart from Python. Anyone who used anything else which was not Python? Okay. Is Miriam here? Miriam. So I think I saw something. Which is... Miriam, what did you use? Miriam, are you here? So there's somebody who was able to use that using C++, if I'm not wrong. Anyway, we'll find out. Anyways, I think now that's it. That's what we were supposed to just do for today. Uh, the key thing was for you, first of all, to try it out so that when I am talking about it in class, I, I don't talk alone. It's not like I'm telling you something that is uh, very new that you have never heard of. So by you doing the assignment first, then us coming to discuss it in class, I am sure it has made it at least easier for you to understand what is happening. So with that, we will end the class there. Then in the next class, we now start, start, start discussing something on web services. Then we will start creating more web services because the key thing of this particular unit is distributed objects and web services. So you look at the objects and also we look at the web service. So message passing was just an example of something that we were looking at. Some something some of the ways that communication can take place. So in terms of messages, that's what you are looking at. So next class, we look at web services. Unless you have any concerns,
anything you'd like to say, any concerns, anything you'd like to be improved. There is none. Hello, hi. Hi. I just wanted to ask that um, let, uh, next time, maybe when you're giving us an assignment, if you could kind of give us more time, because for some of us, when we're trying to install um, MPI, I think I was able to install it at like 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night. So it was mm -hmm. quite a challenge uh, rushing to uh, submit before midnight. Okay. So on that, with uh, the particular thing, actually I wanted to see if now you people can communicate. I gave the assignment, then I gave some time. Then with that particular time, because you are the one who is doing the assignment, you are the one to now tell me that with this particular assignment, we feel like, we have done it up to this point, but then we will like more time so that we finish. But then, with the time that you requested, because people are requested for additional time, they requested for additional time until midnight. So that's what happened. So the additional time that was requested for was until midnight. So I just gave you the time that you had requested for. And then again, also if I give you an assignment that you are, for example, doing for a whole week, it will not be nice for you because you have also so many other things. So that's what I was considering. You have other units, you have your projects, etc. So if I give you an assignment to do for a whole week, it will just not make sense for you. In the end, you will not have done it. But if you're just doing it for a few hours, you just do the best you can and submit the assignment and you're done with the assignment. Now, by the time you're coming to class, we are now going through the concept. It's now easier for you to do it then i can even give you time to resubmit the assignment so for those who had not been able to actually do it or felt like the concepts are too difficult for them to grasp in a short time i think by now you are at a better position i can open the link again for you to submit the assignment again is that okay yes that would be good yes so I'll just open the link again for you to submit the assignment for those who had not submitted so that by on Friday you have submitted that that assignment for those who are doing. So I'll create a new link for the second submission. So there will be a new link, it's not the previous one. There will be a new link for the second submissions. Good. Any other concern? So whenever I give you something, communicate. You see now, you're fourth years, you're not first years. So I am assuming that fourth years are reasoning more than first years. So fourth years can communicate and now tell me, by the way, you're doing this wrong. Kindly try and do it this way. Okay, with this one, with this assignment, kindly give us up to this time. And when you tell me, baby, up to this time, you make sure that by that time you have also finished. So if we, we communicate like that, I, I have no issues. It, it's not, uh, it's, it's just uh, a simple thing. It's not a very difficult uh, thing. Just communicate. And then uh, also communicate through your class representative. Because like the last time, for example, the e-learning was not working for people. I got so many emails saying the same thing. You see, if e-learning e is not working, you just tell the class representative, look here, the e-learning is not working, kindly communicate and ask her that we can actually submit this work maybe tomorrow because the e-learning is not working today. Don't panic. Don't be in a panic mode such that 100 people are sending me an email saying the same thing. Just say, give one person, say uh, the, uh, the particular person, just comes and tells me, by the way, this thing is not working, we will submit it tomorrow. I have no problem as long as you communicate. So just learn to communicate. If you are first year, it could be a different case. But now you are fourth year, you already understand how things work. I have no issues. So I think that's it. Anything else before we leave? Hi. Uh -huh. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. 
Okay, yes. so uh, there was a concern in the class crew earlier on because uh, you gave us a, sh a short notice that you are okay. supposed to use Skype. So okay. most of my classmates have been experiencing problems and they are trying to join and maybe you are requesting that in future you can uh, send a message a bit earlier. Yes, also that was an impromptu on my end. I'm very sorry for that. So also on my end... We found that the particular Zoom that we usually use also had another session, so they were clashing. So I had to find an alternative. And the only other alternative or paid platform that we have was Skype. So I'll try and also have an extra Zoom account. So by the next class, I will also have an extra Zoom account such that if there are clashes, we are not... It doesn't interrupt our sessions. So apologies for that on my end. I didn't check it early enough. So that's what happened. So then we just had to have a class because we do not have much time. So we just had to have a class. So that's why we opted for the Skype. You can okay. also see that I was struggling with the Skype. <laughs> okay, thank you. It's intentional. Okay, thanks. Anything else? Anything else? Okay, so I think uh, you can add your names to the chat. So have your admission number and your full name. Then as you add it to the chat, you can leave the meeting. Okay. See you next week. Thank you. So you leave a meeting so that I know how many people I'm waiting for.